Hello everyone. Today I would like to talk about open public data and how governments, especially the local ones, can be more transparent. But before that, I would like to talk why governments should be more transparent. The state is one of the biggest data producers that is, probably the biggest of all. It has data over citizens, economy, mobility, natural resources, among others. But most of this information is available only for, to public officials. And sometimes even they cannot take advantage of it. Either because they don't have the expertise to use this information in all the ways it could be used, or because this information is disorganized and gets lost. Transparency is a way to hold governments accountable and also enables innovation. We can only overcome the biggest challenge we face today as a society if we use the collective intelligence. We access the information, we create knowledge together and we share this knowledge. As a Brazilian, I would say that corruption is a challenge for many communities. There are many strategies to fight corruption that involve freedom of press and legal frameworks, but digitalization can also play a big role in fighting corruption. When governments publish data over purchases, they extend the publicity of this data and allow civil society to develop algorithms that might seek for red flags in these purchases. That's that was one of the projects I work in Transparência Brasil, in which we look for irregularities and emergency purchases related to COVID-19 crisis. Another huge challenge we have as a society is climate change. Here in Germany, governments are making great efforts to give data to citizens and let them work with innovative solutions to fight this challenge. Two examples from Münster, where I live. Some years ago, during a heat wave, many fishes from our local lake died. In that year, at the city's hackathon, a team developed a system to monitor the quality of water in real time and allow faster interventions. The system was later implemented. Another example, MISA has also this year carried out a thermographic survey of the entire city area to find out heat leaks. The houses with heat leaks will be notified and this data will soon be available for consulting. Probably interesting ideas for climate neutrality will come up. So we all can see how important data is but unfortunately, many governments still cannot deal with data. And why is that? I believe that now, in 2021, we all understand that we cannot transform something that is analog into digital and expect to work in the same way. Last year, for example, we all have been to Zoom birthday parties. And as long as it was good to see our friends, we know that this was not like a real party. It is good when we change these activities to the virtual environment, we need to adapt them to this new context and explore the advantages that might come up. The same thing can be said about government's activities. We cannot mix innovation with digitalization and we definitely cannot think of digitalization as merely scanning documents. Creating a public digital strategy means implementing a data-driven culture that we use the tools available, take the advantage of the amount of information and let the citizens participate in the policy design and implementation. I saw many attempts to create a more transparent public administration, like governments with good intentions that invest a lot of time and money developing transparency portals and some even develop APIs. API, for those who don't know, stands for Application Programming Interface. It allows applications to request information directly from the source. So instead of downloading a spreadsheet, you directly request the information you want and using your app. Well, many of these attempts that I saw, unfortunately, had little return. Some databases had apparently no use. Some APIs had little or no feedback. And this happened because most of these attempts had failures. 
Most databases didn't have the information needed to evaluate the policy. They had no standardized data and even important data was missing. Some APIs were broken due to lack of maintenance. The data was their pro forma and apparently even the government was not using it properly. To avoid this kind of mistake uh, and to create a real data-driven culture, I want to share here a cultural asset that is usually presented in the private sector. If you work with public administration and have no idea how to start, this might help you with a small projects inside of your department. We call this the analytical cycle. It is a holistic approach to a data-driven process of decision-making. It might seem a little simple at the beginning, but I see intelligent people making the mistake of not taking each step of a time. The secret here is to establish what are the activities related to each step and don't run before you can walk. I'm going to focus on the three first steps because that is where the main mistakes are made. The first step is to define exactly what problem this project is trying to solve. We are here naturally oriented by top-down politics and target plans, but can we still make our problem more simple and specific? Here's an example. How can we increase the number of kids enrolled in schools in a neighborhood? So we need to understand who those kids that are not in school are. The next step is where things start to get complicated because many people mix exploring the data with let's validate the answer that I already have. Some of you might be thinking let's look at the data about poverty for example or let's cross information of newborns, enrollment and neighborhood. Those who have this thought are missing an important step that is to see what information you actually have. You all would be surprised to know how many local governments don't know that. This is what I call the cleaning moment. When we organize and standardize all the information we have that is directly or indirectly related to our problem. Here, it's time to take our spreadsheets and write down what each observation is and what each variable means. What are the measures used and if they change over time, what are the key variable, variables that allows us to cross this data with other databases and which these other databases are? In other words, it's time to write down the code books. This will allow public officials to have a better picture of the context and it's more than half of the way of selecting and preparing data to be published. After gathering and cleaning all the information, comes the next step, to analyze the data. Now we can find the answers to the questions that emerge from our original problem. If your office still uses Excel or Spreadsheet, I highly recommend to invest in open source languages. If this is not possible, write down every single step made and save the original and work data. All the steps used to analyze the data must be written down, so you can redo the same analysis in the future. Finally, when the office makes a decision about the policy, it is important also to set what data is necessary to evaluate the policy implementation. Needless to say that here we also need to create code books and standardize the information of this new data. All the databases those used to make the decision and those used to evaluate the policy implementation need to be available on the Transparency website, taking care, of course, of all the data protection requirements. I wouldn't say that all published data needs to be available in APIs. It depends on the amount of data and users that this data might have. But if you are in Data for Government 101, I wouldn't suggest thinking about creating an API at this moment. If you are a public official, I hope that the analytical cycle tool was helpful to you and I encourage you to learn more about it. Information was always a valuable asset and this is now clearer than ever. 
The more governments can structure and share information, the more the society will be able to join forces and build better communities. Thank you.